Hello, this is Dominic Haley coming to you from Los Angeles, California, and it's my pleasure to be hosting another live stream uh, today. Um, it's noon my time, and um, I hope that you're doing well in whatever time zone you are currently inhabiting. Uh, this will be part two of my quarantine transcriptions little mini series. Um, again, the overarching series that is being hosted by Impulse Creatives is the Close Encounter series. The goal of this series um, and, and my mission is to sort of share music that I love uh, from a, in a very intimate setting at the keyboard, my keyboard here in my apartment, and um, sort of explain in greater depth than I normally have the chance to um, in a concert setting when uh, performance is the, the main focus. So for example, today we'll be focusing on uh, two specific pieces um, and then the composers that were involved in these, these masterpieces. Um, the first piece that I'd like to talk about and perform for you is a short little um, delightful work, uh, a bonbon of music, I would say, uh, a piece entitled The Tic Toc Choc by the French Baroque composer Francois Couperin. This piece, um, it's rather extraordinary in that it's only about three minutes long, but it really encompasses um, a very specific and lively character. Le Tic Tac Choc, the name of this, of this piece, um, is supposed to be character, characterful and um, emulate the ticking, the talking, the chalking of a clock. These words don't translate to anything, but rather are just symbolic for a clock. Tic Tac Choc, Tic Tac Choc. Um, so, and then, and then uh, in parentheses, Couperin also writes with little hammers. So again, we, we sort of hear this music box or this little clock that's, that's chugging away rather furiously. Um, there are several different versions of this piece. Uh, the version that I will be playing for you today is in fact a transcription. Um, the reason that I, I'm, this is on my transcription program is because this piece is originally written for not this instrument. It was written for the harpsichord. Now, many people might say, um, well, the harpsichord is also a keyboard instrument. Yes, it is, but actually, uh, it's quite different. Um, an example of this is, is a picture I'll show you just now. So here we see Couperin um, on the left side of your screen, and then you see a harpsichord on the right side. As you can see, first of all, this is a very ornate piece of uh, instrument. And back in the Baroque days, they really enjoyed um, sort of painting and creating an instrument that visually was as stunning as it sounded. Um, so again, every harpsichord is dramatically different looking. Uh, some are uh, simpler, some are extremely ornate, meant for palaces. This one looks to be on the more ornate side, I would say. But what you should really notice is the two manuals of this instrument. As you can see, there are two levels of keys. This allows the performer to play the same note with greater repetition. So, so basically on the piano, we have one uh, keyboard. So if I want to play an F, I have to play, I have to play the same note on the same key. But when you have two manuals, it's like this keyboard is transplanted, transplanted up, and I can play two Fs like this, dun, 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 and you can basically repeat uh, notes quite quickly. Um, so again, Couperin wrote this piece, the Tic Tac Choc, for the harpsichord, for two manual harpsichord. He specified that he preferred to have this performed on an instrument that could do this fast repetition of similar notes with the two manuals um, in order to really emulate the clock as best uh, as best an instrument can. So the reason that I am playing it, I'll get more into detail why I'm playing this particular uh, transcription of this piece. There are three versions actually of the Tic Tac Chuck. The original version that really fits the harpsichord the best. There's a version that I'm playing that was um, worked through by a rather famous pianist, uh, Eugene de Albert. Uh, I also did a little bit of working on it myself in terms of uh, fitting the hands in uh, slightly better than, than he had originally written. Uh, and there's also a third version um, that was released uh, 
that is slightly, in my opinion, is the least successful version. Um, and I will show you all three so that you can kind of get an idea of uh, the three differences. First of all, I will play you um, the transcription by Eugene de Albert of Le Tic Tac Choc, originally written by Francois Poupera. <laughs> So that is the, um, that's the version that I typically perform these days. Uh, to give you a bit of backstory, uh, being a little bit naive, I, when I purchased my first copy of this piece, I assumed that was uh, the version that everyone plays. And then I, as I listened to more and more versions, uh, Grudy Sokolov has a phenomenal, iconic recording of this piece. Um, many other, Alexander Thoreau has another wonderful recording. I started realizing that people were doing different things. Everyone had their own, almost their own version, and I was rather confused. So I, I did some more research and discovered a lot of really interesting aspects. So the really, the, the very original version of this piece uh, is different. And let me show you uh, the, a picture of the scores, the differences. So let's see. So here we have two different scores. Obviously on the left, we have a more parchment style, which is the original version. On the right is the beginning of what I just played for you. We, are, we are already see many uh, striking differences. The first being that um, the right hand in, in my version is playing a rather more toccata-like figure, which is more... And then the right hand in the original is more... So, already we have a rather different type of uh, musical element. Uh, in uh, the original version, he writes legeramente uh, et marque, which means uh, really lightly but marked. Um, and then in the, in the version that I performed, it says Allegri, allegrissima con bravura, which means fast and with a bit of bravura. So, Eugene de Albert um, is, is envisioning this as more of a brilliant, toccata, virtuoso type encore, I would say. Um, but again, uh, they have different characters. Uh, my version it sounds, again, in the beginning like... And then the original is, is lighter. Uh, it sounds more like... So 
So it has a bit more of this uh, more delicate music box like figure. So um, one of the interesting reasons why I actually decided to go with um, Eugene de Alberts and is because in some ways uh, it's a little bit more successful um, on more pianos. This is more of a logistical thing that I was thinking about. Um, many pianos do not have great repetition to the hammer. My piano here has slightly above average repetition, I would say, uh, but some pianos really uh, suffer and you can never be sure uh, what kind of repetition of the hammer you will get. In Eugene de Albert's version, I find that it's much more secure, more consistent, and it allows the fingers to repeat the notes and it also, um, it allows the piano to respond to the repetition in a much more uh, safe way, perhaps. Because again, um, when you're doing repeated notes on the piano and you're doing them with two hands, that's actually sometimes less secure um, because you have more moving parts going on. Um, in Eugene Albert's version, um, which I also finagled a little bit, I, I sort of constructed for my own uh, purposes, I actually do a lot of the repetition with one hand. So what I do is I do... So, so what happens is my right hand is doing a lot of that... Dip, 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 and the left hand is simply doing... It's just kind of hopping around. And that way, in my experience with many different pianos, um, I find that that repetition uh, oftentimes allows the piano to speak better, faster, and it also allows slightly more of an um, increase in speed if one so desires. Uh, depending on the mood, you can play this rather brilliantly, you can play it a little bit more um, docile. What's also interesting to note, actually, is that Kupran did prefer this piece to be played on that two manual harpsichord, like um, I had shown the picture of, where the hands would be, uh, you know, again, the hands would be playing kind of like this. But Kupran did state uh, at the bottom of his, of his score, he said, um, if you're playing on a one manual instrument, what you should do is you should play the right hand as written, you should take the left hand, play it down an octave, so that way the hands aren't doing this. Because as you might have noticed when I was playing, my hands are pretty much on top of each other the whole time. And that is technically difficult. Um, so, but when you put the hand down an octave, it doesn't sound nearly as satisfying. So it would sound something like this. Suddenly, we get less of this kind of chaotic hammer on hammer type of action, and the separation of the hands really shockingly changes the music. Uh, one would not necessarily think that that would be the case, but um, the difference between um, the difference between and you know doing it down the octave. actually be becomes a little less busy and a little less uh, just impressive sounding, I would say. So that's one really interesting difference that I noticed um, between uh, going down the octave and not. And certainly for me, um, I would never want to go down the octave and separate the hands like that. Uh, it just doesn't sound appealing at all to me. One, uh, a few little interesting facts about Kupran, though, that I, I thought I'd bring up is that uh, Kupran was actually known as Kupran the Great because uh, he came from a a very musical family, so uh, everyone thought Francois was the jewel of the musical family and, and he literally had the nickname The Great, which uh, is something I think we would all aspire to having. Um, also, I, what I didn't know uh, until more recently was that Bach was actually a huge fan of Couperin's music. It's interesting because Bach and Couperin really wrote very different uh, styles for the piano. Bach was a little bit more conservative um, in his, uh, not in his compositional writing, but rather in, in, in his uh, labeling of music. He labeled his music as partita, and he, he named it just a dance, a dancing, rondo, gavat, beret. But Couperin was much more liberal with his character title pieces. Again, he called this piece the tic-tac-choc, which is nonsense words. He's just trying to make it sound like a clock. 
he could have called it the clock, but I get the feeling that he had a sense of humor because, um, you know, calling it with tic tac or, you know, with the little hammers is, is, is very delightful. Um, but Bach and him exchange letters and Bach expresses admiration for the little gems of pieces that Gubron wrote. Gubron actually wrote four volumes of piano, uh, not piano, sorry, keyboard pieces. There was no uh, real piano back then. Keyboard pieces. Uh, this is from the third volume in 1722, uh, give or take. Um, so actually this would have been written uh, about 10, about a little, a little over 10 years from Kubrat's death actually. So this was at the end of his life that he was writing these short pieces. Again, he had uh, titles uh, for pieces, uh, you know, like the, the Mysterious Barricades. He had titles that um, were quite um, descriptive and told you the story of the piece. Unlike Bach, who would be very ambiguous with his writing. He would, I mean, he would call something the Goldberg Variations, for example, but we wouldn't know anything about what the story is unless you tried to figure out the background. But for most of Bach's music, uh, there is no story. The music itself is this, is this wonderful story. Um, but Cooperon made a huge influence on, on composers later in, in the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, one notable figure was Brahms. Brahms was actually extremely ecstatic and excited about Cooperon's music. Uh, he studied it quite um, quite diligently. He even was an editor for one of the editions of Cooperon. So uh, I, I believe actually uh, in one of the editions of, of this piece, in fact, um, uh, the original, and then there's also another version of the piece, which is just not successful at all, um, that Brahms edited. So um, I, I believe that uh, you know Brahms was certainly influenced by these character pieces for Brahms' own late music, his own character pieces, his intermezzi, his late uh, rhapsodies, his late um, ballades. Uh, these, these short type pieces actually have a hearkening back toward a Baroque era, and. He was influenced by Bach, most certainly, but I feel like Couperin is some, sometimes neglected when we talk about composers that made an impact on our musical canon. Another composer that was greatly influenced by Couperin was Ravel. Ravel wrote a piano piece entitled Le Tombeau uh, de Couperin, which is basically um, dedicated in, to the memory of Couperin. And these pieces, again, harken back to this rather uh, Baroque-type era, the Baroque forms of music. And um, this is one of the great masterpieces of the literature. One version of this piece that I was actually really charmed by is a version that Richard Strauss uh, orchestrated of the Tic Tac Chuck. And I'll actually play that for you uh, briefly. It, it's, it's really interesting uh, because uh, this was around the 1923 uh, um, that Richard Strauss wrote a divertimento, Opus 86, for orchestra. Uh, that was meant to, um, he, he basically took lots of Couperin's pieces, he took about half a dozen um, and orchestrated them, and he intended them to be uh, put along a ballet, dancers. And, and certainly, when I listen to this piece, uh, I can see dancers, so um, I don't think he's uh, misguided at all. But I find this, this version to be uh, quite different from the piano version. He adds some some differences. Um, so I hope, I'm just going to play this for you. Uh, I don't have an orchestra with me, but I'll play a recording for you that should appear on your screen. And um, it's a few minutes long, but again, I find it to be really engaging and just a totally different take on the piece that you just heard. Thank you. 
So, um, as you can see, <clears throat> uh, this version of the Tiktok Chalk is, is quite different. Uh, I find it to be, again, obviously it's for a chamber orchestra, not a full orchestra. This is, by, by the way, this is the New York uh, Chamber Orchestra with Gerard Schwartz conducting. Um, and again, I, I just find that this piece has a, a wonderful new impression and imagination to it as um, Richard Strauss turns something that really sounds like a clock. <laughs> This, this, this luscious type work at times. Um, again, uh, the two pictures that you saw would have been Gubran and Richard Strauss. This is from Strauss's Divertimento, Opus 86. The next piece that I'd like to talk about uh, today is a, a wonderful Valse Caprice by Liszt and by Schubert, Franz Schubert. So uh, let me quick show you wonderful uh, photographs, uh, 3D renderings actually of uh, Liszt and Schubert that were done by a, um, a fabulous renderer artist, Heidi Karimi. So here we see Liszt on the left and Schubert on the right. These uh, 3D renderings were actually done rather recently, um, I would say in the, in the past few months, in fact. And when I first saw them, I was quite, uh, they were quite striking to me because uh, we're not used to seeing composers look so lifelike. Um, I was rather amused by the decision to pick uh, Liszt facing, uh, I guess, looking at the side because uh, Liszt was um, the first pianist to turn the piano in the way that we are now accustomed to seeing the side profile of the performer's face. So, and this is indeed his right side of the face, so that's the side that his audience would have seen. So uh, I would imagine that this is the side that he is most proud of and why, uh, cleverly, why the artist decided to show off the right side, uh, the pianist uh, side of the face that the audience will always see. And then we see on the right, um, a less, a slightly less elegant looking Schubert, but at the same time, um, perhaps one of the greatest geniuses in my eyes of, uh, of, the, of, of musical history. And I believe that Liszt also agreed. Um, Liszt was, in addition to being a great virtuoso and performer of his own music, Liszt was incredible. Their pieces um, to a greater public. Because Liszt had a huge following. He had um, you know, thousands, I mean, hundreds of people that would, that adored him. Um, and Schubert was more of an unassuming, um, rather, uh, not, not a shy person. Uh, he, he, he was very lively, but he was less, he, he cared less about kind of marketing himself. Um, he was, he was very bad at it, in fact. And, um, and financially, he was never quite in, in good spots. He only, at the end of his life, in the last year of his life, was the first time he ever owned a piano which is shocking considering how much repertoire he wrote for this instrument and how, and how beautiful and gorgeous it is. But, um, but anyway, I mean, uh, Schubert wrote hundreds of waltzes, valses, and uh, Liszt took note of them and realized that these little tiny waltzes were absolute gems. And Liszt decided to put together medleys of these waltzes to perform for the public and to basically um, basically present Schubert's music in a respectful way um, and introduce it to as many people as possible. Um, now, this particular piece uh, that I'll play for you is based off of three different waltzes. I'll play the waltzes for you right now, um, and then when I perform the piece for you, uh, listen for them, and you'll hear them coming back time and time again. So, the first waltz that we hear um, is this rather severe severe waltz uh, in A minor.
next waltz that Liszt uh, uses is the, is the following waltz. are from Schubert's 12 Valses Noblos, um, 969, and they were written in 1827, one year before Schubert passed away. Um, so these were at the end of his life. Uh, an earlier uh, waltz, waltz that uh, Liszt uses is from Waltz's uh, Sentimentalis D779. It's uh, this one that Schubert does write the word zart, which translates to tenderly. So those are the complete waltzes that are the source material for uh, Liszt's Valse, uh, Valse Caprice number no. 6. Now, in addition to Le um, Tic Tac this piece has multiple versions. Three versions, in fact. The first version is one that, if you know this piece, uh, the Liszt Schubert piece, you probably know the first version. This one is played by uh, Horowitz, by many pianists all over the world. Uh, it's, it's, it's the most common. Uh, the third version is slightly more complicated um, than the first version, but uh, it, it's very similar, in fact. Uh, the second version is what I will play for you today. And this one, for me, is the most meaningful. Um, because it, it's the longest, it's the most difficult, um, uh, list adds some absolutely inventive elements that uh, I can show you. Uh, this version is also dedicated to a really special person, uh, a woman named Sophie Mentor. Sophie Mentor was a, a German pianist, a young pianist that uh, was a student of Liszt's around the age of 23. And Liszt was absolutely, um, thought she was well, he, he called her, he said, no woman can touch her piano playing. He thought that she was just um, out of this world. And many people um, called her an incarnation of Liszt. So unfortunately, you know, we, many people have never heard of Sophie Mentor. Uh, I'll tell you more stories about her because she was quite, a, quite an interesting lady, I would say. Um, but this particular version of the waltz was dedicated to Sophie Mentor, and with good reason, because uh, it's, it's the most challenging a version of the three versions, and um, I think Liszt is trying all of his, uh, as many tricks as he can to make it as uh, delightful as possible. So I'll be playing Liszt Schubert's Vols Caprice number no. six, the second version dedicated to Sophie Mentor.
So this um, this piece for me is 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 just true Viennese charm. And I hope that you heard some of the waltzes that I had demonstrated beforehand, because certainly they're there. And um, what's quite interesting is that Liszt was, was very clever in the sense that the piece begins in A minor. This, this severe A minor. And Liszt was clever enough to find a waltz that is in A major. couldn't find a more tender, sweet waltz than that. So the transformation of this piece from A, uh, a minor to A major is just uh, truly just divine, I would say. So uh, Liszt, this also shows that Liszt <clears throat> was dedicated. I mean, Schubert wrote several hundred waltzes, and uh, this, is, this is the sixth Valse Caprice, but Liszt did other medleys of, of Schubert's music, and so Liszt was perusing hundreds of of scores and they weren't neatly bound like they are today on imslp.org or wherever. You know, Liszt was researching. He was. Um, that's something that we forget sometimes about Franz Liszt is that this shows a lot of care for his fellow colleagues um, <clears throat> and um, for, for trying to share their music with with the world. Because again, with Schubert, I mean, he writes several hundred waltzes. I mean, he might be writing them on you know scribbling them on napkins or during parties, just writing out these, these two line, you know, one, one of these waltzes is only two lines. The... So, I mean, to, to, uh, to <clears throat> sort of try to find these waltzes by list, I think is quite, quite admirable. But I'd like to talk a bit more about, about Sophie Mentor, the, the dedicate uh, of, this, of this particular piece. So again, um, <clears throat> she was born in Munich, and uh, from an early age, her talent was recognized as, as extraordinary. Uh, I'll show a picture of her really quick. Sophie, right there. Um, and so she, she grew up uh, studying with uh, Tausig, uh, other great camps at the time, but around the age of 23 is when um, it really was quite clear that um, she was ready for Liszt and to study with, with the, the venerable uh, master. Um, so, immediately, Liszt took note of her, and he was astounded at her abilities virtuosically, um, at her abilities musically. Uh, she was known for Liszt's, uh, for performing Liszt's first piano concerto. Uh, this piano concerto actually had a disastrous premiere. It was performed uh, not by Liszt, but uh, one of his pupils. It just really did not go well, and the audience was, did not receive it. But she reinvented this piece completely, and certainly today, uh, we, we, we think of this piece, uh, the first concerto, as being uh, just uh, one of the great masterpieces of the repertoire, but um, she sort of brought its attention to the forefront more than anyone else. Um, and I would say that uh, another interesting fact about her, uh, for all of the cellists that might be watching, is that she was actually married to David Popper for 14 years. David Popper uh, is known for his Popper etudes for cello. and. This just kind of shows how small the musical world is. Uh, you know, Sophie, uh, David Popper, uh, all these, these names are, are just some iconic uh, figures in, in the musical uh, history. And um, again, uh, Sophie was uh, very confident in her abilities. In fact, she would oftentimes uh, take various works of a list, rhapsodies of his, uh, number two, number six, number 12, these are two, three of them three of my favorite and three of the most popular rhapsodies that Liszt wrote. She would take these and she would kind of fragment them, kind of do what Liszt did with this uh, Vols Capri. She would take three different sources and she would make her own Hungarian fantasy and, and, and just kind of improvise. And uh, Liszt kind of, uh, he, he, he basically praised uh, the ground that she walked on because he was just really in awe of her, in fact. Um, and uh, he did say that she was his only piano daughter. That's quite a, a title to have from uh, the greatest pianist of all time, I would say. Um, she, um, <clears throat> she, uh, despite marrying David Popper, uh, she, she still concertized quite a bit. She, was, she had one daughter named Celeste, uh, but she was very busy with uh, performing. She did teach at St. Petersburg uh, Conservatory for a, a few years, but she was just, you know, too too high in demand uh, as a performer, and she ended up leaving this post uh, to, to to concertize. Um, 
she was at the deathbed of List. Um, he, uh, by all accounts, he was most touched that she was present uh, for, for that. Um, a fun fact is that uh, after amassing great wealth from concertizing, she actually bought herself a castle in Austria. And uh, if the stories are correct, she actually uh, had chicken wire fence surrounding it, not to keep people out, but to keep her cats in. She actually owned 50 cats, apparently. Um, and this is, uh, account, this is an account by none other than Claudio Arau. Claudio Arau is one of the great golden age pianists. And apparently, um, Arau, as a young boy, he actually was taken uh, to meet Sophie Mentor. The, the time she would have been 70, he would have probably been about 13 or 14. He, at the time, he was already a rather accomplished pianist at that early age, but um, he was ta taken there by um, a mentor of his, Martin Krauss, um, <clears throat> who introduced uh, the young boy to the, uh, the, the great Sophie Mentor. And uh, apparently, yet he, uh, uh, Claudio Arau said that in, uh, in his account that she was adorned with jewels that apparently she said she received from her Russian audiences who would rip them off their clothing, their, their, their fingers, and throw them on stage at her because she was so, um, it's just everyone was enamored with her. There's even a story in Copenhagen of her finishing a concert, going out to her carriage, and realizing that the horses had been undone and that the, uh, the audience members were, were dragging the carriage uh, to her, her place of, of, of stay for the night because they just wanted to help her in any way they could because they, they just loved her. Um, but anyway, uh, she, um, she had you know, many, many cats that she kept. Uh, and even at the time of, of knowing List, um, List apparently uh, liked one of her cats so much that he named it Spot because of a mark on its nose. And, and this cat uh, apparently has paintings done of it. I couldn't find any, but I, 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 uh, she was uh, really um, rather eccentric, I guess, to have you know, so, many, so many animals at her place. But, <clears throat> but still, um, you know, uh, e even at the age of 70, Claudia Arau stated that her, um, her playing of Liszt's second piano concerto in A major was still astounding and beautiful, despite the fact that she was so um, humble and rather um, self-deprecating in, in her talent. She said she never practiced, she wasn't practicing enough. Uh, by all accounts, when she was young, she practiced 10 to 12 hours a day. She was maybe the most hardworking, diligent, uh, and also um, having some of the strongest fortitude considering how much she concertized. Uh, she concertized for decades. She also knew Tchaikovsky, and Tchaikovsky and her were very good friends. Uh, Tchaikovsky actually dedicated his concert Fantasia for piano and orchestra to her. This piece is much lesser known than the first concerto, even lesser known than the second concerto. But it's a, it's a great work. I urge you to check it out. Uh, but Tchaikovsky uh, stayed with her in Austria, and actually uh, one of her Hungarian fantasies that she wrote for orchestra and piano, he, um, he orchestrated it. So basically, you know, she had some some the piano solo part, some sketches for the accompaniment, and Tchaikovsky worked it out with the instruments. He was one of the greatest orchestrators of all time. And then at the premiere, she played and he conducted. So Sophie Mentor is someone that um, I, I, I in, in addition to the great Clara Schumann, uh, Sophie Mentor is another woman in musical history that is just so important and very few people know about. Uh, but again, um, with this uh, list, uh, Vols Caprice, we see that he is trying to give her a little, little unique uh, twist to her version that make it her own. For example, um, most versions, the other two versions of this piece, when they get to this melody, it, it, it ends, um, and then we go back to, but in her version, this goes up into what he calls a la Glockenspiel. These double thirds, this Glockenspiel up top, these, these bells, and then particularly one of my favorite moments, uh, the, this D flat major chord. Normally it's uh, but instead of he goes the 
it's truly magical. <laughs> and um, again, this is the most thoughtful version of this piece. He also writes a rather virtuosic cadenza um, that, that, that combines um, this material and then this, this cadenza. This chord, all this is, this is especially for Sophie Mentor. So um, I, I'm sure she was honored by, by this, this really personal version. And um, what's very interesting about this, again, the second version is that it's, it's, it's incredibly hard to find because it was lost for many years. Only recently was it actually um, rediscovered uh, and, and pieced together by a scholar, by a scholar pianist named Leslie Howard. Um, so actually there are no recordings of this piece, aside from perhaps the one that I just made live. Um, but uh, in any case, um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, I'll just quick take a look if there's anything. Um, but uh, right now I'm not seeing anything. But uh, again, this, this, this series, uh, the Close Encounters series, is um, being hosted uh, by many different artists of Impulse Creatives. Uh, my streams will be every two weeks, so in two, two weeks from today, Friday at uh, noon, is, is when I will do another uh, live stream event on a, a different topic. Um, I'd like to thank Cindy and Alexander of Impulse Creatives for all their work in facilitating these events, all of this live streaming. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, coming into my, my apartment here in this intimate setting and um, I really enjoy chatting, uh, chatting to you, I guess, today about this music that I really care about and I love. And I, I like sharing all these, these stories that, for me, really matter. Um, and again, if there's one thing to take home, uh, check out this woman named Sophie Mentor. She had quite an interesting life, I would say. So, um, I wish you all a great day, evening, morning, wherever you might be. And thank you so much for tuning in.